This is Jay Sekulow in a shocking New York Times poll. 64% of Democrats say to Joe Biden, don't run in 2024. Keeping you informed and engaged. Now more than ever. This is Seculo. We want to hear from you. Share and post your comments or call 1-800-684-3110. And now your host, Jay Seculo. All right, everybody, welcome to the broadcast. We start with uh, where we are politically. We're going to get into this discussion. So the New York Times, not exactly a conservative publication, has uh, conducted a poll, 4% um, uh, air, you know, could be within four percent of the margin of error. New York Times uh, seeing a poll, and this is uh, 849 registered voters nationwide, July 5th through 7th. So very recently, opposition to uh, President Biden running again. This is from Democrats, 64 percent. Well, let me say that again: 60, not 64 percent, Logan of the populace, 64 percent of registered Democrats. Yep are saying Joe Biden should not seek re-election. And it's a narrative you're seeing all over the media, and it's almost presumed that he won't be the nominee in 2024. You have people, like even Stephen Colbert had AOC on this week, and he's encouraging her to run, or last week. These are the kind of conversations that are happening that you're not used to seeing. I think the failure of the Biden administration is clear. They know it. They see their own people. You had a million voters switch from Democrat to Republican Mm -hmm. over the last, uh, you know, since the last time they checked. Why? Because they know that things are going south and going south very quickly. And when that happens, you're going to see something like this. Now, I've never lived in a time where the uh, incumbents essentially did not presumably get the nomination. I have. But you said during the time of uh, Carter Carter that it it has happened in recent history. Oh, yeah. Jimmy Carter had a serious primary challenge from Ted Kennedy. Uh, in 19 for the 1980 presidential nomination and almost won because and and Jimmy Carter's approval ratings were around 33 percent Joe Biden's if you look at every all the polling data like the combined polls is about 34 percent what's interesting is the opposition appeared to be strongest among those under the age of 30 with an overwhelming 94 percent of them saying they want someone else to be the nominee but how much of that is because Biden's not progressive enough I think it's I think it's not progressive enough and he's embarrassing. I think he's embarrassing people everywhere he goes. He's saying something stupid, he's repeating things like repeat the line and he can't read a teleprompter and they see this as a and you see then Ukraine and you see Afghanistan. You've seen failure after failure plus someone who is not respected on a global stage, not respected within his own country. I think it's a very logical conclusion that this will happen. I think they also look at it and go, There's a darn good chance if he be's the nominee, he loses. So we have to put up someone else. It is a very interesting time if you're a Democrat. There's some of my friends. I, I don't really know any of them who think that this Biden presidency has been a success. I think they've all seen, and we're only a year and a half in. It feels like 10 years. We're only a year and a half in to what feels like a failed state that we're yeah. in right now. Only 13% of Americans believe the country is heading on the right track. Let me say that number again. 13% of Americans feel like the country is heading on the right track. That you're barely in double digits there. So again, and of course, a lot of it is uh, the economy issue, uh, and I think really the the economic consequences of of the Biden administration policies. We're going to get into this, and where we look and how we look on the global stage right now is just not the American people aren't buying it, and they're having to pay for it, and it's really expensive. I mean, yeah. it's oh, people are it's, it's breathtaking sometimes. We're, people are shocked and embarrassed. We were uh, sitting with someone last night who's like a Hollywood producer, and they said, look, if nothing changes, you're going to see a massive shift because they can't afford it. People who, people who are progressive understand a lot of times when their uh, candidate gets in, prices go up. It just seems to happen that way, but not like this. Not where it feels out of control. And with this, plus shootings happening all over the country, it feels out of control. And even you can blame conservatives, you blame Republicans, you can blame Democrats. It feels like a mess. And if you're a progressive liberal and you're seeing a president, you have a president who is a a Democrat in there, and there's Roe versus Wade just got overturned and there's uh, shootings happening, it still feels like nothing's getting done. I'm sure if you're a progressive liberal, you're going, we have to have a change because the policies that you put him in place for aren't happening. And if you're a conservative, you're, you're kind of going, we told you so. All right, folks, we are in a matching challenge here at the ACLJ for this month, and we need your help. That means any amount you donate to the ACLJ, we get a matching gift for. Let me encourage you to go to aclj.org. That's aclj.org. We'll be right back with Rick Grinnell.
A Florida judge. An unprecedented warning from the world's top intelligence agencies. In their first ever joint speech, FBI Director Chris Wray and his British counterpart, MI5 Director Ken McCollum, underscored what they say are growing threats, spying, hacking, and other covert activity from China. We consistently see that it's the Chinese government that poses the biggest long-term threat to our economic and national security. And by our, I mean both of our nations along with our allies in Europe and elsewhere. The most game-changing challenge we face comes from the Chinese Communist Party. It's covertly applying pressure across the globe. This might feel abstract, but it's real. Regulators say China may already have a secret weapon, your phone. Last week, an FCC commissioner warned that TikTok is feeding sensitive user data from its app directly to Beijing. It's a really popular app. Millions of people are using it. But really, that's just the sheep's clothing. Underneath the data that it's pulling, it really functions as a sophisticated surveillance tool. The Chinese Communist Party is inside the gates. We yep. closed the Chinese consulate in Houston, Texas, because they were spying on American universities. Uh, welcome to the fight. This is important. They are, they are in our universities. They're all across our businesses. The Chinese government poses an even more serious threat to Western businesses than even many sophisticated business people realize. American industry corporations need to listen uh, to the FBI and his counterpart in British intelligence very carefully. They need to wake up. If you do business with a Chinese company, if you do business in China, you allow their researchers uh, into your labs. Hey, welcome back to the broadcast. Everyone, in a few moments, we're going to be joined by Rick Rennell, uh, because uh, if you're watching us on our social media platforms, we're just playing a clip from um, Christopher Ray, the FBI director, warning about China. He spoke at a joint event in London uh, alongside the head of MI5. MI5 is the counterpart for the um, the counterpart for the FBI. Do we have Rick? We do. Hey, hey Rick, I want to get your uh, impression first on. Um, Christopher Ray said the scale of the threat we're talking about is not something uh, that we believe we can investigate our way out of or certainly arrest our way out of. China is the most game-changing of all threats in the sense that it pervades so many aspects of our national life. This coming from the FBI, FBI director. You've been warning about this for a long time. How serious is this threat? Well, first of all, let me just tell you, as the former acting director of national intelligence, China is a crisis. Russia has always been a problem, but for anyone who tries to pretend like Russia is a bigger problem for the United States than China, they are literally not reading the intelligence. China is a crisis. We've known this for many years. My frustration with Chris Ray is that he's been very slow to focus on China. As you know, he has put a lot of resources into this phony Russia investigation uh, calling Donald Trump a Russian asset. The FBI has literally the wrong crises. And so what I would argue is when Chris Ray says that uh, we can't arrest our way out or we can't tariff our way out or we can't be proactive enough, he's wrong. Of course we can. We're the United States of America. What we have to do is get focused on China and act in big, bold ways like Donald Trump was doing. You know, I, when, the thing I don't like coming out of Chris Ray's mouth, and you just said this, it sounds like when they say, I don't think there's ever been a time, and this is what he says, where China is more of a threat. Okay, well, that's kind of a given. But then this idea that we can't, you know, investigate our way out of this or arrest our way out of it, well, then what do we do? We're not going to have a war with the Chinese. So th th to me, th th this is, again, another one of these things where you set the bar low, so that when your inaction isn't measured against much, Rick. Let me be very clear. There is a whole group of people in Washington, D.C., who think that the rise of China into global domination is inevitable. And let me repeat that again. There's a group of people who believe we cannot stop China from being the global power that they are, and therefore we should work with them or manage them. I absolutely disagree. We are the United States of America. We, when we get focused on a problem, we solve it. We have a problem with China. And guess what? Let me tell you. 
I've traveled the world. I've worked at the UN for eight years. The world knows that China is a problem. The Eastern Europeans, the Balkan nations, the Europeans, Middle East, Africa, they know that all of the things that China comes in in the beginning to promise never materialize. They say they're going to build these big projects, and all they do is ask for visas, bring their own people in, and they take the money. Everyone around the world knows this. Chris Ray seems like the last one to realize what's happening with China. Now, I think a lot of people, Rick, uh, see what's going on in our own country, and we've kind of tuned out international affairs. I think you look at it and go, okay, China's bad. We know they're doing bad stuff. But right now we are so focused on – You know, we just were talking earlier about the polls that most Democrats don't want – uh, Joe Biden to run for re-election. You know, when, when those kind of things happen, and obviously conservatives do not want him to be the president. So when you have that, you feel like there is this sort of failed state mentality going on. It's hard to take your eyes and put them to China, but it kind of does, I'm sure you can explain more, uh, impact everything. Well, one of the, I think you hit it on the head there, Logan. One of the things that we need to remember is that uh, we need an America first foreign policy, and we shouldn't feel bad about that. We shouldn't feel like it's a selfish move. The, the, the reality is an America first policy of putting rule of law first, democracy, human rights, capitalism, that benefits all of the world. That benefits our allies. Every country puts themselves first. When the strongest country in the world puts itself first to, to build a positive economy based around the rule of law, that will absolutely benefit the rest of the world because there will be uh, rules, established rules enforced by the global power. We can't trust China to do that. They don't act uh, in ways that are going to help the rest of the world. Our policies, our America First policies, uh, we should be very proud of. They're not selfish policies. They help the rest of the world. And our diplomats should be making that case around the world. Why does America First help the rest of the world? Because we establish rules that are rules-based, capitalism, rule of law, and a sensitivity towards human rights. You know, it's interesting, Rick, also, the Chinese had a huge influence or attempted to um, on college campuses, and they did. And then that became public. And because of pressure that was put on, the colleges had to, had to back away with their Chinese partnerships in, in a large, a lot of state universities included. So this idea that there's nothing we can do is bogus because we've seen if you if you shine light on it, action can be taken. First of all, there's one thing that I have been pushing for a long time that I think would make a dramatic difference is that we should not allow American companies that work inside China to also be able to have contracts with sensitive government programs, whether it's DOD or Intel programs. Uh, I'm not saying you don't get to work in China, but I am saying that you have to choose. You don't get to work on sensitive U.S. programs while also working inside China with a, with a requirement that the Chinese have that you have a Chinese partner and you share data information with that Chinese partner. That entity is then beholden to the Communist Party. Your information is shared. I don't care what kind of firewalls you have. Right. The reality is, is if you do business in China, the Chinese Communist Party knows exactly what's going on and has all of your information. So let's, uh, let's do this. Let's play Christopher Ray. This is the comments he made at this conference. Take a listen. At least see that it's the Chinese government that poses the biggest long-term threat to our economic and national security. And by our, I mean both of our nations, along with our allies in Europe and elsewhere. And I want to be clear that it's the Chinese government and the Chinese Communist Party that pose the threat we're focused on countering, not the Chinese people and certainly not Chinese immigrants in our countries who are themselves frequently victims of the Chinese government's lawless aggression. And the issue then becomes, of course, you recognize the problem but what's lacking here is solutions, Rick. <laughs> yeah, totally. You're sitting there thinking, as you're listening to the FBI director, Chris Ray, no, duh. We've known this for five years. W what are you doing? You're the, you're the director of the FBI. What are you doing to articulate the problem this far after the problem has taken hold? is not progress. And, I, and if I were uh, in Congress, if I were a senator, I would be hauling this guy in to say, 
well, what are you thinking of the solutions? What are you doing? Because he has literally uh, commanded an agency that has told us constantly that Donald Trump was a Russian asset and they literally uh, classified information that would have disproven that. They, they hid the information from the public. It's an outrage and still someone needs to go to prison. The FBI and the DOJ are not going to get their credibility back until people are prosecuted for what they lied to the American public about for years. Uh, you're heading to Al- Albania. Um, let our audience know we'll be praying for you, and I know it's a big trip. Tell us what's at stake. Thank you. Well, I'm going to uh, Serbia, Albania, Montenegro, and Israel over the next two weeks. And, you know, as a guy who's in the private sector now, I feel confident that the Trump policies of economic development for the Balkans it should be a priority. That's how we're going to solve uh, problems. You know, uh, I believe that we should do everything to avoid war, and that means the private sector investing so that people have jobs. It means the State Department being at the forefront with tough diplomacy. We should not have war as an option constantly. And so I'm going with uh, some private equity guys to look at projects in the region that bring American, uh, not only American, investment, but also American values to the region, and I think it's really important. That's great. And then I'll finish up in Israel with uh, CPAC Israel. That's great. Uh, ben Shapiro and I are leading the delegation, and uh, it should be a fantastic uh, time in Israel. That's great. And we, we of course, have an office in Jerusalem um, and uh, do a lot of work in Israel and also in the international criminal courts, as you know. Hey, folks, uh, Rick, thanks for being with us. We're in a matching challenge campaign. You've heard a lot from Rick on the scope and nature of what we're doing your support makes a huge difference. That's right. Right now, it is a part of our July matching challenge, which means every donation you make is effectively doubled by another donor who is waiting in the wings to support the work of the ACLJ. So if you give $10, it's effectively $20 to the organization. 20 becomes 40 so on and so on. And you can do that really easily. There's nothing extra you have to do. Just go to ACLJ.org. You'll see right on the homepage, big matching challenge, donations doubled. Donate today. Click that big green button. And your tax-deductible donation will be effectively doubled when it comes to the support of the organization. You don't get charged double. Someone again is on the other side. They're saying, hey, if that person gives $10, I'll match it. It's a really great time to do it. So if you're thinking about making a donation, now is the time uh, during the month of July. And you can do it right now during the broadcast. And that is at ACLJ.org. Don't go there just to donate, though. There's incredible content you need to check out as well. Be right back. I was at a board meeting at Jews for Jesus, and the executive director said, we've got a case. The Supreme Court had just granted review. It was about literature distribution at airports. We wanted to have the Bible study meet in the school, but it turned into a problem when the principal said, no, you can't have it. I told her that I wanted to sing Noel, and she said, the principal said that we can't have anything to do with Christ in our songs. We marched around the country defending evangelism in Chicago, in Boston, in New York, Atlanta, Texas, uh, Southern California, Northern California, and points in between. We got a letter one evening from the IRS saying they wanted all this information that I that we all knew immediately was not right. How do you fight the government? How do you fight the IRS? Tea Party groups say they're being targeted by the Internal Revenue Service, and they're enlisting the aid of the American Center for Law and Justice. They were trying to shut groups down that they disagreed with. This was very, very serious. The federal courts do not need to become monitors of state trespass actions, and that's all this is. We were looking for the right to speak our minds and our consciences, and we won that right today. Religious persecution is a situation where your life is literally put in jeopardy simply because of what you believe. Can you help? Can you do something? He's on death row. And so we launched an international campaign. His freedom now rests solely on diplomatic efforts by the United States government and world leaders dedicated to human rights. The release of Andrew Brunson. He is the American evangelical from North Carolina, held in Turkey for more than two years. There was an Air Force plane that came from Germany that had been on standby. We're flying and they finally left Turkish airspace. It's like, okay, we're really out of Turkey and, and free again.
move to another topic because uh, President Biden signed an executive order uh, dealing with Roe versus Wade. He did not like the decision. He called the Supreme Court rogue, um, and he put an executive order in place. Yeah, I think we actually have a bite from President Biden. I should lead with that. And when he was making this announcement, of the executive order, a lot of people started texting me. A lot of calls coming and saying, "What does this mean? Is yeah. this, you know, what could he actually do?" And I think there is. Oh, look, I think there is concern always when this stuff starts happening that just because sure. you won a Supreme Court case, which seems like should be the end game, uh, well, that now not, a a president it's come big, and, no. and yeah. undo it. it is definitely big, but the fight continues on, and it will likely for the rest of our lives. Yeah. So let's uh, take a listen to President Biden from this past Friday, I believe. We cannot allow an out-of-control Supreme Court working in conjunction with extremist elements of the Republican Party to take away freedoms and our personal autonomy. So so you don't like a decision of the Supreme Court in the United States, and now they're the out-of-control Supreme Court. Let me think about that for a moment. But then think about this. He puts in, C.C. Howell's with us, senior counsel, does a lot on these issues. Puts in an executive order. And let me read you, uh, this is under Section 3, little i. Um, and actually section four, the secretary of health and human services shall in consultation with the attorney general and the chair of the FTC consider options to address the deceptive or fraudulent practices related to reproductive health care services, including online and to protect access to accurate information code word. We're going to use the FTC and the department of justice and HHS to try to close down. You guessed it. Crisis pregnancy centers and Javier Becerra would know about that, the HHS secretary, because he was the defendant in a case that we brought with others to the Supreme Court of the United States where he lost by using these same arguments. But they are clearly targeting the crisis pregnancy centers. Right. We continue to see that uh, constantly. We saw it with members of Congress and attorney generals asking Google to remove um, crisis pregnancy centers from any search that included abortion. They go after these clinics. We also see it in New York where they're trying to go after the crisis pregnancy centers um, because of the information that they give. And this is the same type, this is the same language, um, the deceptive or fraudulent practices related to reproductive health care um, so that people get accurate information. And that's always targeted to crisis pregnancy centers because the claim is they give false information, which is ridiculous. It's the exact opposite. The crisis pregnancy centers are the only ones that are providing true information to pregnant women so that they can make a truly informed decision about their baby. But the idea that you're going to unleash the Department of Justice, HHS, and the Federal Trade Commission against pro-life crisis pregnancy centers or women's resources centers, as they're called. We represent a lot of them across the country, and uh, some of our staff was on the phone with them as late as last week dealing with this issue. We've got a team, a task force set up at the ACLJ to defend these crisis pregnancy centers from, by the way, everything from violence to government overreach. But this is a, this is in the president's executive order, Logan. So this is front and center. This is just one of many. I'll give you another one in a minute. Yeah, I think maybe that one is the one that maybe we should all kind of look at and go, oh, that's kind of a concern. Some of these are, like you said, a lot of them are, are just words. And when it or is a time when you see crisis pregnancy centers being you know, harassed, being you know, bombed. attacked, bombed, uh, you know, everywhere around the country it's happening right now, uh, and you see these protests still happening, they have turned violent. Uh, it is a concern when the president starts saying things like an out-of-control Supreme Court with it, when really, actually, if you look at how the Supreme Court has ruled, uh, other than this case, which they don't care for, it's not like it's been you know, super conservative. Super conservative. The Remain in Mexico was you know, overturned. These right. things are happening, but because it's abortion, it becomes the number one thing. Of course, now they're out of control. Uh, here, yeah, but look, it's politics, too. Let's play. This is another statement from the President Biden. Take a listen. We need two additional pro-choice senators and a pro-choice House to codify Roe as federal law. Your vote can make that a reality. I know it's frustrating, and it made a lot of people very angry. But the truth is this, and it's not just me saying it. It's what the court said. When you read the decision the court has made clear, it will not protect the rights of women, period, period. I think there is also a lot of people who are very upset. We brought up the Biden approval rating because always, and we've said this for decades, the Supreme Court, for some reason, is never a big 
election. You always think it's going to be. You think it, never it should is. be, and it doesn't even come up in half the debates. I think last time it did not come up right in the debates. Right. Uh, and obviously, it's the lasting legacy of a presidency. Sure, it was. It's sure, the Supreme sure Court. was for the previous president. It was the previous president. It's for, for a lot of them. Yeah. Because that's what can continue your policies going forward or can continue something like that. It looks like that, at least. But then here's what they're doing. They're going to unleash the, the power of the federal government to go after these resource centers that are trying to convey a pro-life message as if they're engaged in criminal enterprise or fraudulent and deceptive practice. So they don't hide it. Then they want, under Section 3B, let me read this one, to promote access to reproductive health care services the Attorney General, again, the Department of Justice, and the counsel to the President, White House counsel, shall convene a meeting of private pro bono attorneys, bar associations, and public interest organizations in order to encourage lawyers to represent and assist patients, providers, and third parties lawfully seeking these services throughout the country. Now, look, you can do whatever they want, but now you got the Department of Justice and the White House saying we're going to coordinate this pro bono effort. This tells you where they're at. Right. Private entities, private attorneys now they're engaging and training to how they're going to go after any state that wants to have pro-life laws and how to attack that. And I don't know that that's ever been done before. Well, could with you imagine, the private could, I mean, I can imagine if a president were to say we're going to do for border enforcement, what we're going to do is we're going to get a meeting of private lawyers together to help on border enforcement. And the left would go crazy. You can't do that. You can't bring private lawyers involved in this, but it's abortion. So again, they think this is where Alito was right in a lot of ways. It's abortion. So they think all the rules can change, but guess what? The Supreme court said that can't happen anymore. So that's not the way it is anymore. And yeah. period. And, and that's what I was saying is when people were running, they didn't become an issue. And now that it didn't go their way, even though they have a democratic president, they are seeing uh, that it's ineffective. I and mean, you even had like so Hollywood celebrities, you had uh, Deborah messing, I think went on and said, what? Like she turned on Biden, eventually had turned back. She had so much heat saying, my entire, I, I got you elected because this is, I wanted you to stop things like this. What's the point of us even Hollywood trying to support a Democrat if they can't get things done? But it's like, again, it's a fundamental misunderstanding of how the law works. Right. Uh, but yeah, people absolutely. have that. But people have that. You're exactly they think right. It's, a president can do everything. That's right. So they think he can just rule by executive order, which right. we've seen several pres presidents try to do. Yeah. But there are three branches of government, and people forget that. So just because you get the president in, that doesn't mean that the legislative branch and the judicial branch are controlled by that same president. And the judicial branch is supposed to be apolitical, where you, we shouldn't have politics. Of course, we know we do. But we shouldn't have politics in that branch. They were simply, in that Dobbs decision, they were simply following the Constitution, saying there is not a, a right to abortion in the Constitution, which is correct. That's all they decided. They it the now it goes to the states, and everybody's up in arms. Yeah, well, here's the reality. So we know now that the Department of Justice, the Federal Trade Commission, and the FTC, and the HHS, Health and Human Services, are going to target pro-life crisis pregnancy centers. And that's why the ACLJ, we've got a task force of the ACLJ to defend them anywhere in the country. We already are. Your support makes a huge difference. We're in a matching challenge this month. That means anything you donate to the ACLJ, we get a matching gift for. If you want us to be able to stand up to now the federal government again in this executive order, having the Department of Justice go after crisis pregnancy centers, which is exactly what they're planning, then support the work of the ACLJ at aclj.org. If you donate $10, we get $20, 20 40 You donate 100 it's 200 So. We encourage you right now, go to ACLJ.org, support our work, ACLJ.org. Coming up, we'll get a report from Washington, D.C., an attempt to codify federally Roe versus Wade. Back with more in a moment. Here's what I want to say to our ACLJ members, or for those of you that are enjoy watching this broadcast, whether it is going after the deep state, whether it is litigation that we're engaged in, whether it is defending the persecuted church and getting individuals out of prison because of their faith in other countries, whether it's training lawyers to fight for religious liberty, not just here in the United States, but around the globe, whether it is producing a daily, five days a week, one hour live television and radio broadcast turned on thousands of radio stations, on TV platforms, on social media platforms. Your support of the ACLJ enables us to do all of this. We want to encourage you to support the work of the ACLJ. And when you do that, you're supporting our production teams, our videos, whether it's that kind of production and other things that we are working on. The ACLJ is front and center on this. We're in a matching challenge campaign. Any amount you donate, we get a matching gift for. Go to ACLJ. ACLJ.org today. That's ACLJ.org. Keeping you informed and engaged. 
now more than ever. This is Seculo. And now your host, Jay Seculo. Hey everybody, welcome back to the broadcast. We're taking your calls at 800-684-3110. We've covered a lot of topics. Biden's approval ratings down in the 30% range, 64% saying they don't want them of Democrats don't want them to run again. You've got that whole issue. And then at the same time, we we talked about uh, the threat from China. Then we talked about what the federal government going after crisis pregnancy centers in an executive order signed by President Biden. Now coming up, we're going to be talking about the codification. There's an attempt at the federal government level to codify Roe versus Wade. In other words, make it a federal law, which raises a whole host of issues. And we've got a, a blog up at ACLJ.org where we talk exactly about that. So, if, by the way, you need to be get on our all of our social media platforms, Logan. People need, if you want information, uh, we've got a lot of information, a lot of content available. Yeah, I mean, we obviously always promote uh, supporting the work of the ACLJ, going to the website. But what I try to do whenever I'm on here is that you have to go and spend time uh, on our website, on all of our social media platforms. And we're everywhere. We're on YouTube, Rumble. We're on Twitter and Truth. We're, we're everywhere you can get content. We are available on Facebook, obviously, and, and Instagram. But when you go there, you're going to see unique content that we post, and specifically you'll find incredible articles, incredible video content that's created by our team each and every day to keep you informed, as we say in the beginning, informed and engaged uh, with what's happening in the world around you. And that doesn't happen. That work also doesn't happen where this great content is created without the support as well of the ACLJ. So it all kind of ties back in. You know, if you could see just beyond these walls, the amount of people that are working on the incredible content here, I think you would be shocked, surprised, or amazed at the, the quality of people that come to work here and put in this incredible content. And this is just a small, this one hour a day we do here is just a very small portion of a big deal, a big popular portion but still a very small portion of all the things that we offer. Yeah, a lot of content up. Uh, let's go to the phones. Let's take uh, Richard's call, Logan, out of all right. California. Richard in California, you're on the air. Hey, Richard. Yes, yes. Good morning. God bless all you guys. You. Uh, it's been a while. I've been. It's a real pleasure to be able to ask you this question. Uh, I've been trying to find out uh, what the right to privacy has to do with allowing abortions. And, and they're having a big deal here in California where they're afraid that, uh, you know, this thing, Roe versus Wade, has been, uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, taken care of. Yeah, yes, yeah. Yes. Th- look, there's a lot of that. And there's also a, a new thing that has come out over the weekend where the president has considered whether to make this a public health emergency. And he said, uh, you know, he's looking at whether he has the authority to do that and what impact it would have. Yeah, so so uh, the, uh, just abortion access. By yeah, yeah, but so here's what the right to privacy was the, the the false basis upon which Justice Blackman wrote that the right to abortion existed in the federal constitution, which was rejected, by the way, by people like Lauren Schreib and Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Um, so there was never this, but that was the basis they used. So now what they're doing, and CeCe can address this, is some of the states, they're going to the state's constitutions and trying to read that right into the state's constitutional parameters that's what's happening right now that's right and so if we're talking about the the right to privacy that was created like judicially created um they're trying to do that now with state constitutions saying well but your state constitution has a right to privacy which we just saw again the supreme court strike all of that down so i don't think they'll have much access there there i think this other privacy issue that you're hearing about right now is they want to keep all medical records very private because they're worried about if you have a miscarriage or uh, you know a different kind of problem in your pregnancy they don't want those medical documents then getting released to government to say oh you had an abortion in these states where abortion is legal which is again a fabricated problem it's fabrication absolutely all right, we're going to take more of your calls when we come back from the break. 1-800-684-3110. We'll be joined by Than Bennett talking about this attempt to federally codify Roe versus Wade. And make it through the House. We'll, we'll see what all that means. 800-684-3110. Don't forget the matching challenge for the ACLJ. Any amount you donate, we get a matching gift for us. Let me encourage you to go to ACLJ.org. That's ACLJ.org, and your support will be doubled. be matched by somebody, another one of our donors. Uh, again, Get the information we have. We're on Twitter, Jace, at Jay Secular, at Logan Secular, at Jordan Secular, at ACLJ. We're on Truth, same situation. We're on Facebook, YouTube, Rumble, a lot of places to get information. Of course, ACLJ.org. Back with your calls at 800 684 3110.
Now, with the Vice President, Secretary Becerra, and uh, Deputy Attorney General Monaco, I want to talk about an executive order I'm signing to protect reproductive rights of women. In the aftermath of the Supreme Court's terrible, extreme, and I think so totally wrongheaded decision to overturn Roe v. Wade, I'm asking the Justice Department that, much like they did in the civil rights era, to do something, do everything in their power to protect these women seeking to invoke their rights. In states where clinics are still open, to protect them from intimidation, to protect the right of women to travel from state that prohibits seeking the medical attention that she needs to a state to provide that care, to protect the woman's right to the FDA approved Federal Drug Administration approved medication that's been available for over 20 years. Protests across the country today, from Chicago to New York, but the biggest was in Washington, D.C. And while their anger was directed at the Supreme Court ruling, the goal was to pressure President Biden, some even briefly tying themselves to the White House fence. The call to action coming just 24 hours after President Biden's executive order aimed at protecting access to reproductive health care services. Many of the demonstrators saying the president's actions do not go far enough. They want him to do more. Keep protesting because keep making your point. It's critically important. We can do a lot of things to accommodate the rights of women. But as president, I don't have the authority to say that uh, we're going to, you know, state Roe v. Wade as the law of the land. As president Biden has acknowledged that his power is limited, pleading with supporters of abortion rights to make their voices heard at the ballot box. Fundamentally, the only thing that's going to change this is if we have a national law that reinstates Roe v. Wade. Hey, welcome back to the broadcast, everyone. We're taking your calls at 800-684-3110, 1-800-684-3110. There's an attempt now to codify, that means put into law, Roe versus Wade. This is the new move that the, uh, the pro-choice groups are making to try to get another version of federal protection. Right, and they've done it several times. I mean, we've seen these bills come up in Congress several times before they've, got, they've been defeated each time. Yeah. But if, if the Supreme Court is going to say rightfully so, so that there's no constitutional right to abortion, then they're going to try and make it into federal law. But we have a team acting on that and ready to strike on that as well. Yeah, so let's go to Than Bennett, our Director of Governmental Affairs in Washington right now. And then give me your take on where this is. I mean, what's what's the language? There's two bills. What are we looking at? Yeah, I'm actually glad Cece started where she did that. This is a, an attempt that has been defeated before because what has happened now, Jay, is the House of Representatives has decided that they are going to again bring up two bills. The, the main focus is going to be on the one called the Women's Health Protection Act. And like you said, it is an effort to codify, to put into federal statute uh, the standards in Roe, so to make it a statutory right uh, to pr- pursue abortion. But, Jay, it goes a lot beyond that. It also says that states cannot enact any uh, sort of restrictions or any sort of protections for women uh, that are seeking these abortions. So you're talking about things like informed consent protections that a state might put in place or hospital admitting privileges or even health and safety standards. Jay, all of that would be out the door if the, the Congress would enact and the president would sign this bill that they're going to likely vote on on Friday. Uh, procedurally, Jay, here's what's going to happen. Tomorrow, the House Rules Committee is going to meet and they're going to put out rules to govern debate on these two bills. And they're likely going to come to the floor on Friday. Uh, Jay, just quickly, the second one, honestly, this is a messaging bill. It's a, it's a bill that says uh, states cannot interfere with people who are trying to cross state lines to obtain an abortion. How many times have we told people listening to this broadcast, if Roe versus Wade is overturned, it is going to make it a matter of state law. Some states are going to permit abortion. Other states will not or they'll enact restrictions. And some people will cross state lines to try to seek that. Yeah, I'm telling you, they're, they're putting that bill on the floor of the House on the same day to try to distract from the one where they're trying to codify uh, Roe v. Wade into federal law. But you know what's ridiculous about that is, and, and I'm just going to make the, the legal statement here. A state cannot prevent a person from leaving their state to go to another state if they were trying to seek an abortion or seek to go to a restaurant, for that matter, whatever it might be. That's interstate travel. It's protected under the Constitution. So putting that as a law now, or it's something we've we've got to look at this because this may happen, is a nothing but a publicity stunt. That's not reality. Right. It's smoke and mirrors. It's totally a sham. 
Uh, you can travel between two states you always have been able to. And so it's ridiculous. It's basically they've made this bill to say what we all know the law is. Somebody can leave a state and go into another state. That is the law. And we know that. And so this is it's just smoke and mirrors. But here, listen to what this is what I'm going to play uh, Vice President Harris's statement over the weekend. Take a listen to this. We also need Congress to act because that branch of government is where we actually codify, which means put into law the rights that, again, we took for granted, but clearly have now been taken from the women of America. And that does have to happen. And we should not allow ourselves to to minimize the significance of that, which is Congress needs to act. So what's going to happen in Congress? Let, let's go to that first then. What's the next move here? So last September, the House essentially took this same vote. Now, they've updated some of the language in light of Dobbs, but the impact is the same. It, that bill passed the House 218 to 211. I suspect, Jay, the vote this Friday will be uh, something similar to that. But it's noteworthy that they're taking this vote again in the House because they don't have to do that. The bill has already cleared the House. What they need to do is pass it through the Senate. Here's why they're not doing that, Jay. They've tried to pass this bill twice in the Senate, and CC alluded to this a moment ago. Both times it failed. And here's something I really want people to pay attention to uh, this week as the messaging sort of rolls out. The blame for that on the pro-abortion side has already always said, well, Republicans filibustered the bill. Jay, there, there were only 49 U.S. senators in favor of this bill each time. That is not even a simple majority. So we're not talking about a, sil- a filibuster that's keeping this from passing the Senate. A majority of the United States Senate is opposed to this bill, and that's why it's not being sent to the president for his signature. Let me ask you this, though, Dan, because people are going to ask this. There's been all this talk about nuking the filibuster. Four row versus Wade, basically is what they said, a special limited legislative filibuster removal. What what are the chances of that happening? Well, it's totally on the table. I mean, we've talked about it on this broadcast before. We'll say it again. Uh, they would do it if they had the votes. And here's kind of where that plays out, Jay. Uh, every uh, Democrat in the United States Senate is willing to nuke the filibuster in order to pass this legislation, except for Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema. Uh, when it comes to the substance of this bill, there are actually two Republicans that are willing to join Democrats on a narrower version of it, uh, Susan Collins and Lisa Murkowski. Now, Jay, the, the math is very difficult for Leader Schumer to work together, but I am telling you, if he could come up with some a combination of 50 votes to nuke the filibuster in a limited capacity for this issue and then use a different combination of 50 votes, maybe with a couple of Republicans, to pass a codification of Roe, maybe a little bit narrower than this bill. Jay, he would absolutely do it. So I don't want people to take their eyes off the ball. I I, I don't think the Senate has the votes right now, but we're going to make sure that this is still front and center and that the real ramifications are known to the senators that would be taking those votes. Yeah, I think it's right for people to be excited that Roe got overturned, but I think there is a a concern. Look, we're talking about all of these legacy pieces and to show you that there is always going to be this, not always, but at least during this presidency, I feel like, and maybe until the midterms, a uh, something hanging over going, I mean, that's true. this could change rapidly, and our team needs to understand that. And our people who listen to this show need to understand that, that just because there was a big victory in the Supreme Court, which there obviously was, that this could quickly be undone, and that is scary. Well, you know, look, CC brought this up when we were talking before we went on air, and this is true. Planned Parenthood said that only 3% of their business was abortions, right? Then ask yourself this question. Why are they closing up clinics all over the country if it's just 3% of your business? Right. It's absolutely true. I mean, that's that's very telling. I'm like, okay, if really, truly what you do, abortions is 3% of your business, just because you can't do abortions in this state, why do you have to close? I mean, you still have 97% of your business that you can return. And, you know, I'll I'll say, too, when when Logan's saying, you know, we can't stop, I was flying back from Washington, D.C., and I was standing next to one of the leaders in Planned Parenthood, of course, she had no idea who I was, but she was strategizing. They were on the move. She was flying from the East Coast to the West Coast. They had conference calls. Yeah. So don't think that they're thinking oh. we're defeated. They're going to yeah. fight, 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 and we have to, too. Yeah. Yeah. If anything, this will be the biggest fundraising probably month they've ever had. Sure, because for them, this is for real. And, Than, you, you deal with Planned Parenthood, and they're more activated now than ever. Oh, definitely more activated, certainly in Washington, D.C. And, Jay, I would say it's spread across the country now. I mean, you talk about 
uh, Planned Parenthood facilities that are closing in states that have passed these laws. I mean, uh, that is exactly why we're engaging in all 50 states, both both states that are restricting abortion and ones that aren't, Jay, because it really shows the fallacy of what they're about. I mean, you know, if a woman comes in seeking a genuine health care and not abortion services in almost every case, what happens to that woman? They get referred somewhere else because in most cases, those facilities don't even have the machines to provide right. the service that 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 woman is, is seeking. So, again, that's why we're engaging the state laboratories, because that's where the debate has moved. Uh, but look, Logan's correct. It could very, very quickly come back to the federal level. It is this week, Jay. So we can't take our eye off the ball there either. Let's go ahead and take Jerry's call. This is an interesting one. We'll give you. Right, Jerry, in Rhode Island, you're on the air. Hey, Jerry. Hello, team. Uh, a comment to what CC was talking about. Yep. That second bill is just to spur up ignorant people yes. by the midterm. 100%. But the question is, what is what's the status of tracking the leak from the Supreme Court now that rolls over? Is it gone by the wayside? No, I doubt it. I think they probably. My guess is they probably know who did it. They're probably taking action. I'm guessing. Uh, because the end result was the decision that was leaked was very close to the final decision. In fact, really, the only difference was the final decision had in it uh, a response to the dissent. Right. That was the, only, the truly the only addition was they had to address the dissent's opinions. But, you know, it doesn't th- that doesn't change the fact that there was a leaker but and look, it was illegal what happened. Yeah, and and they doing, should still be. I don't know if we're going to f- hear any more about no, it or not. not. It's an independent branch of government. But I'll tell you, the intimidation, on they were, they ran uh, Justice Kavanaugh or attempted to run him out of a Morton Steakhouse. I mean, th- they're paying groups are getting paid to give tips when they find a Supreme Court justice. Yeah, exactly. And you see these sort of doxing of all these organizations that even say. Explain to everybody what doxing well, is. Well, it's just like, okay, for a very, I mean, again, this is very low-level protesting, if I'm being completely honest, and we're being honest with is it something like Morton's who put out a statement saying, hey, we just don't want our customers harassed. We don't care what political side you're on. You know, we're a restaurant. Please right. leave us alone. Obviously, people have the right to protest. And when they said that, then uh, Morton's got flooded across the country. It's a chain. Uh, with fake reservations so then in theory they were booked therefore no one was coming in and the money was coming through so that kind of thing is what happens and continues to happen and and again it's sort of the new form of protesting it's not necessarily always in the streets not necessarily always in your face someone disagrees with what you do they're going to figure out a way to cause you financial or uh, physical harm yep and fan we've got to stay on this legislation though people need to understand that just a matter of hours. Rules Committee meets tomorrow, Jay. The vote will be on Friday. And if it passes again, it'll be back in the United States Senate. So we'll stay engaged. All right. We're going to fight, folks. We need your help. We're in a matching challenge campaign. Logan's going to let you know what you can do, folks. But this is a really important time to stand with us. Yeah. Uh, we're we're going to take some phone calls. Give me a call. 1-800-684-3110 if you want to be on the air. Let's support the work of the ACLJ. Effectively, all donations are doubled right now because of amazing members. We're ready to match your donation. That's at ACLJ.org. $10 becomes 20 so on and so on. We'll be right back. After protesters chased Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh out of a restaurant this week, the intimidation isn't stopping there. A leftist group is offering people cash money, a bounty for intel on where the justices are. I think what we're seeing here um, in this story and is a and is a pattern of abuse and violence um, is a direct attack on the independence of the judiciary. Uh, the assassination attempt, these intimidation attempts of every every Supreme Court justice who voted to overturn Roe v. Wade. Keep protesting, um, because keep making your point. If these protesters can go to a justice's house and they can go to a restaurant, where is it that you don't think it's appropriate for a group of protesters when to go? We condemn intimidation. We condemn any violence. Peaceful protest, uh, people should be allowed to be to be able to do that. In a restaurant? If it's peaceful, for sure. Really? Peter. Is that creating a potential really bad situation when there are people, even if they're uh, being peaceful at the time, they're angry. Peter, we have condemned any intimidation well, and violence. Restaurant. I'm done here, Peter. Peaceful protests in history have made some progress. Women's suffrage movements, MLK, but that's not where we're at these days. You have the social justice I would not even warriors, but hooligans who are going out intimidating people. Everybody in this country needs to take a deep breath uh, and remember what 
the First Amendment protects and express themselves in that way. Ray also says one of his domestic priorities is investigating an uptick in attacks and threats on pro-life businesses following the Supreme Court ruling overturning Roe v. Wade. There's a right way under our First Amendment to express yourself and violence and destruction of property is not it and that's what the rule of law is all about and and we have seen a number of attacks against faith-based organizations, pregnancy resource centers. Hey, welcome back, everybody, for the last segment of the broadcast. Let, let me give you something interesting here. So we're going to talk economy for a little bit, and I know if you want to talk to us on that, by the way, 1-800-684-3110, gas prices, food prices. It was blame all this on Vladimir Putin. That was the Biden team. They were out. They were messaging that. President said it, Vice President said it. This was their Vladimir Putin invading Ukraine has caused this. Now they're saying it's the Republicans are to blame for the economic pro- problems. Let me read you this tweet. This is from President Biden. We'll put it up on the screen. Republicans are doing nothing but obstructing our efforts to crack down on gas price gouging, lower food prices, lower health care costs, and hopefully soon lower your prescription drug cross, uh, costs. This is not right, and that's why this election is going to be so darn important. So they've turned it now from Vladimir Putin, Harry, to uh, Republicans. And I think if they were relatively competent, they might actually get away with it. Uh, Jay Voltaire has said that if you can get people to believe an atrocity, it op- oh, I'm sorry, an absurdity, it opens the door to atrocities. Now President Biden, who has consistently blamed Russia for high gas prices and inflation that exceeds a 40-year high is blaming Republicans. This is absurd. Even CNN has rightly suggested that Biden's latest maneuver, blaming Republicans for his own failures, is simply horse manure. Virtually no American, with the possible exception of America's mental patients, believes President Biden's claims. Nevertheless, he keeps speaking. And he keeps digging a gigantic hole for himself. Keep in mind, President Biden canceled pipelines, canceled oil and gas leases, insisted on an inflationary vaccine mandate that now deprives hospitals of essential personnel and airlines of pilots. This drives up costs, and he knows it. At the same time, of course, he's given $45 billion dollars to Ukraine. President Biden has imposed sanctions on Russia that are backfiring on the American people as the Russian ruble continues to rise. And so to add to all of this incompetence, what is the president now doing? He is selling oil to China. So we've moved from mere incompetence to malfeasance And I think the American people should be prepared to react peacefully to this level of misconduct. What they've done is they've turned it into a an election issue. First, it was blame the Russians. Now it's blame the Republicans. The fact is, blame their own policies. You close down the pipeline, as Harry said. You 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 put so many restrictions on oil and gas producers domestically in the United States. We we were energy independent. And then you write them a threat letter saying, why are you doing this and how much money did you make last year? But they're also saying we're going to get rid of fossil fuels in three to five years. Oh, yeah. I mean, one of the, the greatest things that could happen for them was for Roe versus Wade to be overturned because at least they have something they can campaign right. on. I mean, I mean but it get, ranks really low. It does rank low. But I'm saying they had something they can talk about. Uh, that's just purely the facts. If you look at, again, the approval ratings we, this morning that we talked about at the beginning of the show, uh, if you look at it specifically, it is that people don't even want him. Democrats don't even want President Biden to be the nominee next time around. You've Gavin Newsom essentially running for president right now in the state of Florida, pretending it's an ad for governor. We all know it's not. It's not really an ad for uh, paid for by his reelection campaign, but we all know it's already him starting to target uh, big swing states like Florida and go after people like Ron DeSantis. So it's an interesting time in politics because, again, they are seeing everyone sees kind of blood in the water. They see it if you are a conservative because you now have an opportunity in the midterms to really change the shape of it. You see it as a liberal if you are looking for a time to shine and you want to go at it. Gavin, you know, Ron, uh, not Ron DeSantis, but Gavin Newsom I mean, almost was recalled. 
And right. then you now have... Uh, now he's the champion. Now he's the champion. And honestly, if we're all being honest with ourselves, brilliant marketing. Oh, it's good marketing. It is. To be running these ads and getting... And he's on Truth Social now? Yes. You know, posting is brilliant. I, I disagree with him on, I think, 100% of his, his political uh, positions. Uh, and I'm seeing San Francisco crumble, so thank you, uh, Governor Newsom. But... You can't help but look at it and go, this is the kind of creativity, this is the kind of the initiative that people need to be looking at and seeing. I don't know who is running his campaign, but it's very interesting. You need to start looking at this. DeSantis needs to be responding, running those same ads. Because I have friends in California, as far left as you can possibly imagine, who are saying if the election was tomorrow, they would vote for Ron DeSantis over Joe Biden. Because at least he's consistent. At least they think he believes what, yeah. he, what he actually says. They don't feel like he's a puppet that's up there being controlled by a far left that he wasn't even a part of until six days ago. All right. All right. Let's go ahead and take some phone calls. All right. Let's go to Sally, who's calling in the beautiful state of Florida. Sally, you're on the air. Hi, Jay. Thank you so much for what you do. My question is, you know, they say in order for evil to triumph, good men do nothing. Right. My question is, where are our good men? Why are we letting Biden and his cabinet ruin our country? I don't see anything fighting him. Just go in there and either... I don't know well, what here's, we need here's the to thing. do. I mean, you, you, the House and the Senate are controlled by Democrats. The White House is controlled by the Democratic Party, the Democrat Party. So the reality is you can it's 50 50 in the Senate. So you can you can kind of do some blocking maneuvers. But the reality is and this is just true. It's the political reality. Uh, they know that they've got a limited time frame here. And that is by November, unless something radically changes. The Democrats are winning the House, and there's a chance that the Democrats get – I mean, the Republicans are winning the House, and the Republicans may even get the Senate. There's a chance yeah. on the Senate. It's going to be closer in the Senate, but the House could be overwhelming. But when you're not in the party in power, when you're in the minority party, you're just, Harry, very limited what you can do. I think that is true, but I also would say that I think the caller makes a very important point, and that is the Republicans need to craft – a constructive yes. agenda, a coherent, cohesive agenda to basically highlight yes. the missteps of the Biden administration. You know, Cece, you ran for Congress uh, 10 years ago. It's been a while, but and the law has changed in those 10 years. Right. But well, I would say elections have consequences, and policies of those elected officials have consequences, and that's what this is. Absolutely. We we have to see that November changes. We have to see the people that care get out and vote and that you do elect people that if you're conservative, have those same conservative values and will actually stand up for them once they get elected. Right. And I see people having that problem. They see, you know, a, a lot of the mainstream Democrats on the air on there on, on both sides of the political spectrum in terms of uh, cable news outlets or online social media. And it has does seem like a ton. The Republicans have been a bit quieter a bit more yeah. reserved in this as they try to kind of get themselves ready for november ready for november yeah. and figure out what's going to happen i mean i do agree with her you need we need more than just lindsey graham out there you know kind of you know, making a stir and saying something they, i yeah. mean it, it, it is interesting because it is harry it's pretty the republicans are pretty muted pretty right quiet. now i mean pretty or they, quiet or they say something and put their i foot think in their they are i also think they really need to think constructively about the whole situation yeah. in the ukraine because that is a situation that has really backfired, yeah. I think, on the American people with sanctions that are helping to drive up American prices. Yeah. All right. We got 50 seconds left. All right. So let me t ask people to do this. We've talked about a lot of topics today, and you've heard from a lot of our people. And you see this broadcast five days a week, and you don't see all the people behind this, uh, the glass here that are helping make this broadcast happen. Your support of the ACLJ makes all of this work here in the United States and literally around the globe. We're in a matching challenge. Very important month. July's a big month for us. Go to ACLJ.org. Any amount you donate, we're going to get a matching gift for. What does that mean? We have a group of donors that have said, if you raise $50 from a donor, we're going to give you another $50 to match that. So then you're not getting charged twice, but it actually doubles the impact of your gift. ACLJ.org for that. That's right. Go to ACLJ.org. Not only to donate. We obviously are promoting that right now as we are part of this matching challenge, but to see the incredible content that's there and on all our social media platforms, back tomorrow.